Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1 this morning, 2 Peter chapter 1. It's good to be here with all of you and see all of you, see a room full of you and um, young people. I know that we have high schoolers, junior hires. I could tell the junior hires as they were tripping down the steps and all of that. You just, we all went through it, right? Seventh, eighth grade is painful, painful years, but... um, you go through that, um, but it was really great to hear you kids sing this morning and to see the happiness, the joy on your faces as you did as well. That was great. Uh, we got to have a group from here at our camp this summer, and uh, it was really a blessing to us uh, to have them. And the girls from here sang a song for us, and I don't know the name of the song, and I was trying to kind of coax that out. I guess it's safe for privileged moments, but it was an unbelievable song. I'd like to hear an encore of it, but I don't know if we can do that here in chapel. It's probably not time to put that together, but it was really great. Anyway, if you've never heard their song, that needs to be, that needs to be sung more often, I have to say. It's very good, very good song. And you all don't even know what I'm talking about. I don't even know what I'm talking about. I know it was great, but I don't remember the name of the song or even what it was about, except there was a guy in it and he was coming by and seeing the girl on the porch and then the girl just totally treated him like a jerk. And I said, good for you. Do it. Do it, girls. But anyway, um, I, I want to preach to you something, and, and I, I, I say this to you, and I know that, um, you know, it, I, it, we're here with college kids, we have the high school kids as well, you're not just spectators, um, but uh, the, I prepared for college students, I, and I think what I'm going to say here applies to all of you, but especially as you are here Uh, Some of you have come to prepare for ministry. Some of you have come because you want to be uh, equipped for service in your church. Uh, Some of you to get Bible college experience. Some of you probably came to just be open to what the Lord would have for you and to be willing to do what He wants. And um, whatever the reason is that you're here, understand that it doesn't really matter whether ultimately you end up in the ministry or are a layman in your church. And I, you know, we would be tempted to say, if you are just a layman in the church, as if that's somehow like lower class, and it's not, not at all, not at all. The point is that you would spend the rest of your life live for the Lord. That's the point. Whether God has for you a future ministry in full-time vocational ministry or not is really not the big deal. Some of you, God, it will be evident that God wants you to preach or teach or be in a Christian school or a pastor's wife. And that will be evident and obvious, and it won't really be something that you can help because it will happen. And so, but, but the point is, and this is, this is the big deal, that everyone from this side to that side and all the way back would live out your life for the Lord at the end when you die, whenever that is, whether it's early or late, when you die, that you'll stand before the Lord and He will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. There cannot be any greater thing in the world than that, right there. To hear that well done at the end of your days. And you know, when, when the Lord says to you, well done, you will not be saying, yeah, you're right. You won't be saying that. You won't be thinking, I knew it. I knew I was doing great. You won't be saying that. You will be standing in the presence of the Holy One the Most High God, you will not think to yourself, I earned that. You will be thinking, no, that's not true. 
I'm not, it was not well done. So I say that to set up what I want to say here in the message from 1 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, to say to you that really the Christian life is not a performance art. It's not a show. It's not, you're not going to get nominated for an Emmy. Uh, you're, you're, not, you're not performing. You're living, you're being, you're becoming. And so you can learn how to do all kinds of things in spectacular ways that impress churches and teenagers will go crazy because they're excited to hear you preach or, or speak or can't wait for whatever. But all of that is really nothing, nothing. In the last day, in the day when you stand before God, He's not going to say, you were the best vocalist ever. He's not going to say that. He's not, he won't have an, an award or a prize because you played the piano really great or you were an excellent song leader or you could preach and hold an audience captive for hours on end. Try not to do hours, all right? <laughs> minutes. Minutes is good. Minutes is good. But you don't get... You don't get a bonus prize for any of those things. There's not a crown in heaven for being the greatest evangelist or even leading the most souls to Christ ever. You, there's no award for that. There's no crown in heaven for it. But what God does want from you is fruitfulness. He wants you to be fruitful. And this is what First Peter, Second Peter is talking about here. Look at Second Peter chapter one, beginning in verse two. Let's read um, some of this passage here. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Let's pray and we'll uh, get into the message. Lord, thank you that we have the opportunity here uh, to open the word together. I thank you for these young people who have committed their lives to you. And I thank you for saving them and calling them out of darkness to walk in your marvelous light. I thank you for their homes and families, parents who evidently love them and want them to succeed in the Christian life. And I pray that all of them would be attentive to the things that are preached here this morning, that they would give attention to their life, that they would make their calling and election sure. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You um, get some funny satisfaction guarantees out there. I, I laugh at some of the ones I see, you know, like on Kleenex, satisfaction guaranteed. I, I don't know exactly how to gauge that, like whether it worked really well or not. If it really cleaned my nose, you know, really cleaned it, like better than any Kleenex ever before, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I've not really tested the satisfaction guarantee on Kleenex for sure. Um, water, you know, you can get a satisfaction guarantee on water. That's, I, I guess it, it wasn't dry, right? 
it, 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 I'm satisfied, right? It, it was wet, and uh, that, that's what I wanted it to be um, there. Uh, nail clippers, there you go. You can get a satisfaction guarantee on the nail clippers, I suppose, that they won't cut them, what, too short? Or they'll cut them. They cut your nails. This is good. If they don't cut them, take them back for sure. Uh, it, you know, the nail clippers. Now, I've never had a pair of nail, nail clippers that didn't cl cut my nails, but, you know, it can happen, I suppose. Um, and uh, parachutes. For sure, I want a satisfaction guarantee on a parachute. If it doesn't work, I'm taking it back. Um, for sure on that. I'm not going to mention toilet paper because, you know, that, but you do want that to, for sure, to work. You know, th they can promise you the world. They can promise you the world, but their promises can only go so far. Their satisfactions, guarantees can only go so far. But God has made us a special guarantee, not a money back guarantee because you didn't pay anything for it but a fruitfulness guarantee. God has guaranteed you that you will be fruitful as a Christian. He has guaranteed it. Our text in verse 8 says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. God gives a fruitfulness pledge to the believer, an assurance if you will. This should make sense to us. Jesus said, by their fruits ye shall know them. So he said that we would be identified, we could be identified as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, as a born-again believer, by our fruitfulness. If a person claims to be a Christian but has no fruit of Christianity, he is a liar. So if God saved you, then you will be fruitful. If you're not fruitful, if, you're not, if there's not the fruit of Christ in your life, then you are not born again. You're not saved. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Those are the two options. You either have the fruit of Christ in your life or you do not. One of, the other, one of, one of those two. Now, since God does the saving work... God gives the fruitfulness pledge as well. His guarantee is better than Walmart's. And Walmart's is pretty good. Like, I've never had them tell me, you can't, you can't return that. I've never had them say it. Now, I'm sure there are some things that you can't return, like toothpaste after you've used half the tube. Um, but, uh, you know, God's guarantee is better, better than Lowe's. They guarantee your money back if you're not satisfied. But God guarantees something better. He guarantees that you will be fruitful. In other words, the work of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God in your life will produce fruit. There's not, there's not a question about that. It will produce fruit. From our text then, I want to show you a progression that leads to this assurance. We'll consider first the possibility of the alternative. So there's a possibility that we might be unfruitful, and that sounds like a contradiction. Like you just said, we would not be, and yet the Bible speaks of the fact, the reality that some will not be fruitful. After this, we'll consider fruitfulness as a probability, then as a reality, a sure possession. And I don't think we'll get time to go any farther than that. The message is longer than the time I have. Do I have five more minutes? No? I have 20 minutes. 20 minutes, all right. Here, we're going to go fast. Okay, not really. Uh, first of all, unfruitfulness is a very real possibility. Verse 9 says, but he that lacketh these things. So I didn't change my mind from earlier. I said, if you're saved, you'll be fruitful. But that does not mean that if you have convinced yourself that you're saved, then you'll be fruitful. That's not the same thing. You can tell yourself I'm a Christian. I'll tell you, I have a family member who I love very much, who lives a life that is as far away from the Lord as possible, but he guarantees us that he's saved because he trusted the Lord as his Savior when he was a little kid. 
But his life could not be more contrary or contradictory to the Word of God at all. That's, that's called convincing yourself that in the last day you'll be okay. There was a guy, this was, I mean, like the filthiest guy, like perverse guy ever that we worked with on our bus routes. We took his kids to church. And um, I mean, the, the man was openly wicked, vile, disgusting. When I witnessed to him, he said, it's not going to be a problem. I said, when you die and you stand before God, how is that going to go? He said, it's not going to be a problem. He said, me and God have an agreement. He said, yeah, like that works. Yeah, you're going to stand there and say, God, we had an agreement, right? That's not going to work. Convincing yourself, persuading yourself that you're okay. It's not the same thing as being born again. You may have deceived yourself into believing that you're saved, but in that case, you will not be fruitful. See, if, we, if we've trusted Christ as our Savior, then we should be looking for the fruit of the Christianity to be produced in our lives. We should be looking for it. We should believe that it will come because this is what happens when one has been born again. But fruitfulness is not promised to the wishful. If you get drafted into the NBA, you will make a lot of money. But that is not the same thing as saying, if you think you're a great basketball player, you will make a lot of money. All right? You might think you're a really great basketball player, and all things being equal, you know, when we're playing Christian school basketball, you might be the best player out there on the field. But the NBA scouts probably are not even coming to watch you play. If they do watch you play, they're probably not thinking, that's the next Larry Bird right there. You don't even know who Larry Bird is, so what am I talking about here? But uh, anyway, he, once upon a time, <clears throat> there's a big difference between the person who thinks, who's told themselves, I'm okay, I took care of that, I prayed the prayer, it's all taken care of, and a person who has the Holy Spirit living inside of them, permanently indwelling them. There's a big difference. It is the man God saves by grace that will be neither barren nor unfruitful. That's why Peter challenges us, in fact, to give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Don't sit back in smug self-satisfaction. Don't presume on the grace of God, but make your calling and election sure. And the way to do that, well, we're going to talk about that here in a minute. Without Christ, you will be barren, you will be unfruitful. The word barren literally means not working, idle. We could understand it in an active sense. Some Christians are barren simply because of the fact that they're sedentary. They just sit and, you know, kind of melt into the chair over the years. The overlap grows, you know, over the chair where the chair is not so visible Later on, they're like watching the grizzly bear at the zoo. You know, if you want to see the grizzly bear move, you got to be there when they feed it, right? Otherwise, that grizzly bear, you can watch that thing for hours on end and it's not going to do a thing. It's just going to lay there because that's what grizzly bears do in zoos. We should also understand it in a mechanical sense. <clears throat> they don't function properly, their engine is out of gas, or else. There's some mechanical problem that keeps them from working properly. When you see a tomato plant that doesn't grow tomatoes, that's not a result of inactivity. Nobody looks for activity from a tomato plant. But, but there's a mechanical thing going on there. The plant has a mechanical problem. So down in Clinton, Indiana, about three hours from here, real close to where I grew up, and uh, we had run over to Clinton when I was a kid, and uh, there was an old Korean-era Korean War era uh, fighter jet uh, in the park there. And uh, it was back in the day when you could ride around in your car with no um, seat belts. 
And uh, my dad had an old 1964 Dodge pickup truck, and he made a set of benches for the back of it. And on Sundays, we'd take drives, and he would do this number while we were in the back, you know. We lived dangerously back in those days, uh, the good old days, right? When we walked to school barefoot and, uh, you know, uphill both ways in the snow, all that stuff. And uh, anyway, so back then, they didn't have big signs everywhere, don't touch. We climbed all over that jet, all over it. And you know, there was never a danger that one of us was going to take off in that airplane because it didn't have an engine, all right? And that's what I'm saying here, that there's this mechanical problem when the Holy Spirit is not indwelling you, when you've not received the grace of God that's in Christ Jesus, when you've not received by faith the gift of salvation, then there's going to be a mechanical problem. You don't have an engine. You can't take off. You can't fly. That's what the Bible is saying here. The word unfruitful means unproductive, useless. Obviously, the two are closely related, and Christians need to consider that this is a real possibility. Some people lack these things. The cause of barren unfruitfulness, he that lacketh these things, this barren unfruitfulness, is caused by a lack of these things. So what are these things? The, P Peter uses that term a couple of times. These things. He that lacketh these things. Notice in verse 8, that if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. And he that lacketh these things is blind. So what are these things? Well, we see immediately in verses 5 through 7, the progression of faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. And we can extend it further because these things are to be added, as verse 5 says, beside this. So to all these things that, as verse 3 says, pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him and those exceeding great and precious promises that are mentioned in verse 4 are partaking of the divine nature are escaping the corruption that is in the world through lust. So a lack of these things is what causes barrenness, what causes unfruitfulness in your life. The reason for barren unfruitfulness, verse 9 tells us, is that he is blind, that is, nearsighted, forgetful, like he can't see anything from very far away. When your eyes are set on temporal things, when your eyes are set on the things of this world, then you will be barren and unfruitful. A lack of these things causes that. So nearsightedness amounts to blindness, really. And when you've set your affection on things below, which is what it means to be nearsighted, then you are forgetful of Christ's work on your behalf. We're... This is the way the Holy Spirit works in us to cause us to take our eyes off the temporal things and to set them on eternal things. Now, I can tell you that you come to a Bible college like this or you're in a high school like Fairhaven Baptist Academy and you are being taught and given all kinds of things, all right? But still, you can be nearsighted. You can have your eyes on temporal things. You can be more concerned, for instance, what other people think of you than you are about walking with the Lord and following Him. You can be more concerned with what you're wearing, the clothes that you're wearing, making sure that you're trendy, making sure that you're stylish, making sure that you're cool. You can be more concerned with that than you are with honoring the Lord and doing those things that are pleasing to Him and pleasing in His sight. And that is to be nearsighted, to seek first the things that are below instead of the things that are above the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And it is easy, in fact, for you to do that in a larger crowd, in a bigger group of people. 
Probably many of you that have moved here, you come from a small youth group, maybe a small Christian school, and maybe that you were the only one in your group or in your class for a while. And then you come here and all of a sudden you're introduced to all kinds of peer pressure and, and social pressures. And you become wrapped up in that and concerned about that and worried what other people are thinking or who likes me or who doesn't like me and so on. And you've forgotten. And when you do that, the result will be that your fruitfulness will be stunted. You might grow fruit. You know, we, uh, our family bought a new house a couple years ago and we had about a dozen fruit trees in the back that had not been cared for for many years. And so they grew, you know, the trees grew apples, like apples, grew little tiny apples. Nobody would want to eat, all right? It was fruit, yes, but not the kind of fruit that would be fruitful, that anyone would desire or want. You can do that by being wrapped up in, in what's happening around you. So, <clears throat> consider this well. Never let yourself presume on the grace of God, but ultimately understand that this sort of thing, this barren unfruitfulness, accompanies a false profession of faith in Jesus Christ. For those who have been born from above then, fruitfulness is a probability. As verse 3 says it, His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to unto life and godliness. He has, in other words, given you everything that you need in order to be fruitful. He has given to you. I need to show you the stream of fruitfulness then. Fruitfulness begins with the gift of God. Verse 3, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things. So the word given is, is the same root, the same Greek root, as the word grace, this is a gift that God has given to you. These things have been gifted to you. It's not just a Christmas present like uh, would be given to you. It is, in fact, your inheritance, which God has given to you to be used immediately. If you, if you, uh, if you grew up or born into a wealthy home, wealthy family, the wealth of the family would be also yours so that all the wealth of the family is your wealth. You, you're able to have, you can afford to have nicer things as a result of that. It would be available to you. Everything you need to be successful. And you'll notice what in particular has been gifted to you. The third verse says, all things that pertain to life unto life and godliness. The word pertain is italicized in this verse. Sometimes when a word is italicized in the King James, it means that the word was added for understanding, but the, the word is not to be found actually in the Greek. But in this case, there is a Greek word behind the word pertain, just that the word pertain goes a little bit beyond. And I, the King James translators desired to be honest with what they were translating there. And so they were careful about that kind of thing. But the Greek word is the preposition pros. Pros means for or with reference to. So this is the meaning. That God has given you all things that are necessary towards life and godliness. All the things that you need. So he's given you all the tools. He's gifted it to you. When he made you his own by the blood of Christ, when he purchased you and gave you redemption and reconciled you to God and justified you and redeemed you, he then gave you everything that you need so that you can be fruitful. But that's not all. The divine power is the fountainhead of fruitfulness. But the stream flows through, look at verse 3, the, the full knowledge of God, the effectual calling, the exceeding great and precious promises in verse 4, our part in the divine nature, our escaping corruption, all of these things, this is the stream. So the fountainhead 
is God's divine power, and then the stream flows through all of these things. Fruitfulness comes out of that. And we could compare it, really, if you know about trees, you know that they have this xylem and phloem. It's, it's like a tissue inside the bark that it works like a straw that pulls the nutrients up from the, from the roots up to the leaves and then brings down from the, the product of photosynthesis down to the roots. And it's, it's an amazing system of feeding the tree. And you know, in, in trees, in fruit trees, the fruit is actually the excess. It's, it's the, all the nutrients that the tree didn't need goes into the fruit. So it has to be a very healthy tree that will be a fruitful tree. There has to be, the, there, the tree has to be feeding itself a lot more than what it needs, and then it stores it in that fruit. So this is what God is doing to us. All these things are the gift of God. He gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He gives us full knowledge of God. He effectually calls us to glory and virtue. He gives us exceeding great and precious promises. He makes us partakers of the divine nature. He delivers us from the corruption that is in the world through lust. And through all of this, He promises that we will, by means of that, be neither barren nor unfruitful. But that's not all. That's God's part right there. There's also a part for us, something that we need to do, because we're not just trees. We're not just sticks in the mud. We're not just standing there like patients on a monument. We're engaged. We're busy. We're called to activity. We're called to work. Participate in the work that God is doing in your life. So fruitfulness then comes by our diligence to produce virtue and so on out of our faith. Notice what the Bible says in verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound. We already pointed out that these things refer particularly to verses 5 through 7. Notice that verse 5 begins with giving all diligence. Giving all diligence diligence. So this is your part. You have to be involved, engaged in this so that you become fruitful as a Christian. You cannot, you must not sit back basking in the glory of God and in His grace and saying, just feed me, feed me, feed me. Oh, no, no, no. You also must be engaged. You must give all diligence to grow as a Christian. So this is what God is calling you to do. Notice, again, go back to uh, verse 5. The verse says, add to your faith virtue, and so on. Now I would point out to you that this adding to literally has the idea that the later one is produced out of the earlier one. So the later one grows out of the earlier one as you give diligence to improve what God has done in your life. By faith, virtue is produced. And then as you work to improve that virtue, the next thing on the list is produced. I could look at it right now. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge. So then as you work to improve that knowledge of the Lord, the next thing on the list is produced in you. And it's not like it's produced like one at a time. Like you get this one and you grow it up, you know, you, you blow, like those big uh, blow up um, tw things they put in yards, you know, and, and it blows up one part, then it blows up the next part uh, like that. But, but rather, these things are all working and growing but the one growing out of the next, out of the next, out of the next, this is what comes of it. So all of these things are the gifts of God. He gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He gives us full knowledge of God. He effectually calls us to glory and virtue. He gives us exceeding great and precious promises. He makes us partakers of the divine nature. He delivers us from the corruption that is in the world through lust. But that's not all. That's God's part. And then 
we give all diligence, and by doing that, God is making us fruitful. It's as if God has provided you with the field and the tools and the seed, and all you have to do, you've got, you inherited the farm, and you've got everything that you need, you just have to go out in the field and plow it and plant it and tend to it so that in the end you will be fruitful. This is what God has called all of us to do. Faith is the starting point. It's already there in place or else you, without faith, it's impossible to please him. So you've received God's grace by faith. And then by faith, you work to improve what God has given to you. This is what <clears throat> produces fruit in you. Now, I'm not going to have time to go through each one of these things, but I just, I, I want to challenge you again, young people, don't sit back and just be like a sponge soaking up everything that's been given to you. But go out and actively seek to improve what God has given you by His grace Go out and seek to improve that day by day, week by week. Be content for growth to be slow. You know, anyone, it, it's really, uh, it's been a detriment to us spiritually that we've moved away from an agricultural society. We really don't understand the way people who lived off the land understood the kind of patience that has to be exercised in order to see these things come to fruition, to, to see fruit produced. But I'm saying to you, young people, at your age, if you will remember your Creator in the days of your youth, if you'll do that, and if you'll seek to improve day by day by day, improve the graces that God has given to you, there will be a great fruitfulness that will be produced in your life. And then, you know, I, I mean, look, none of us, none of us, let's just be honest, we're not likely to be remembered 100 years from now. No one's going to remember our name. No one's going to know who we were. There are not many people in the history of the world who are remembered 100 years after they die. And that isn't the point. The point is to live out your days for the Lord, to be as fruitful, to bring forth fruit to His praise and to His glory, and in the last day, to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I can tell you that that will beat all the daylights out of being remembered 150 years after you die. You won't care and neither will anyone else. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can spend the time in your word this morning. Thank you for the truth of your word, for its faithfulness. I pray that you'd help us, Lord, that we would delight ourselves in you, that we would love you, that we would love to see you at work in our lives, that we would give all diligence to add to our faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and, and all the way down the line so that we would be neither barren nor unfruitful that in the last day there would be a great praise offered to you because of the work that you did in our hearts. What an unbelievable thing it is. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.